clearly gold. I don't think it's going to be gold because, as I said to you, yeah, copper, brass, if it's in that uh, anaerobic mud, it will come out looking like gold. I mean, this is, this is something quite special. Can we get it out, then? Well, yes, of course we can. Is right. there great excitement about this, do you think? I tell you, for me, major. OK. I don't know how long it's going to be. Look, the, the whole ground's moving. There's more there. There is more. <laughs> it's bigger. Go on. It's something superb. I just think it's amazing. Let's get this, rinse it off a bit. There's some enamelling going on. Yeah, on there it. is. There's some blue enamelling on it. I saw that as well. Oh, the tension, the tension. Has there ever been so much tension in an empty ice cream tub? <laughs> Let's have a little look. It's, you know, it's, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. No, it's more than brilliant. In all my years of mudlarking, I've never found anything like this on the foreshore. Thankfully, Johnny, with his several hours of experience, seems to know exactly what we've unearthed. I, I'm saying it looks a bit like something from a Roman epic. I'm calling it a certainly Roman, almost certainly made of gold, and I think it's worth uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds, and you, you can now retire. Stage, that's text from Nat saying that the water's hitting the bottom of the stairs. Is it? Yes, right. we should probably get back. If you look down there, of course, it looks like we've got loads of foreshore. Yeah. But the tide's actually coming in at the bottom of the stairs, so we are actually going to get cut off. As a courtesy, all significant finds should be registered with what's known as the Portable Antiquities Scheme. But before we do so, we want to find out a little bit more about our booty. And if there's one man who can tell us whether our finds are significant or worth little more than the mud from whence they came, it's Jeff Egan. Now, there's two things I know about Jeff. One, he's a National Finds Advisor at the British Museum. And two, he's got a beard, which means he knows what he's talking about. So, we're meeting up with him at Mudman HQ near London Bridge. So here we are, by kind permission of the Queen, we investigate the uh, Tower of London foreshore. And this is our booty, right, Steve? Looks good to me. First of all, how many times a year are you allowed to actually go down onto the, uh, the foreshore there? The general public thing that go down twice a year. I wasn't talking about the general public, Steve. Oh, the I was mud rather thinking about the mud, mud larking people. And nobody can go down there. Never. It's totally protected unless we get, like we did, we got an invitation from the Crown, of course, to go down there. You're just not allowed down there. Nobody can go down there. OK, guys, focus, focus. The finds are here before us. OK. Jeff, what do you reckon? Well, I'm impressed by this material here. It's, uh, it does indeed reflect the military aspects of the Tower of London, as well as life in general. OK, where do you want to start then, Jeff? Well, let's see. Let's start with this object, shall what we? What is this object? Uh, that's a rather viciously hooked yeah. copper alloy clasp end. And these used to operate in pairs. They had either textile straps or maybe a chain to have anchored women's clothing. OK, either uh, side, uh, yeah. Either side, sort of like, almost like a, a cloak uh, clasp today, perhaps, for some smart people. And this one is particularly nice because it's got three knops, and those on the real upper-class ones of these would have been real stones, re really good gem-quality garnets. Early 16th century, late 15th century, but very characteristic of that period. And let's see, there's a tin glazed wear plate, very colourful in its time. And perhaps you can see there are three apples on this, three yeah. blobs with green. And this is part of a great big, what's called a charger, a dish with a fantastic pitcher of fruit on, so suitable for eating a meal off or indeed keeping fruit on. And this might well have been made in the immediate area. There's factories over the other side of the river in Southwark on the south bank of the Thames, making exactly this in the early 17th century, mid 17th century. So this is probably a local piece. It hasn't gone very far. Wow. And these all hand painted then? Oh, they? yes. A, OK. Is that called habit of hand? Habit of hand is when you can do three, very quickly, three pieces of fruit or okay. whatever. So on. people themselves become almost mechanised. That's right. Right, gotcha. Habit of hand. Well, would this bit have been very expensive? Is it's it... a sort of medium quality plate. It's got a bit of white colour, which is supposed to be quite smart. But back then, to have something white would have been amazingly flask. It said that you could... If you have it purely white, it had a real cachet with yeah. it that we don't really understand today, because you could see just how clean the whole thing was. Enough dressmaking and homeware. Let's wave goodbye to our feminine sides. It's man time. Well, military things, these yeah. pieces of shot. There's two here that are cast together, deliberately so, that they do a bit more damage as they came through the air. That is an accident. You actually do get double Absolutely, shot like that. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. You sometimes get a little bar holding them together. And it whirls yeah. through the air and it makes a much bigger hole That's than right. it takes. Yeah, right. And you tried snapping it, it doesn't, so there probably is a bar in the middle yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. 
So a, a range of sizes. But you know, you get an idea of being smacked with one of those, eh? Yeah, heavy take things. You better actually take your leg off near R enough. Really? Oh yeah, something that size. And now it's time for the biggie. Our star find, the golden horn. Well, it's a bugle of some kind, a very decorative one, and it's probably from a bandsman of a military unit, or it could be a more general symbol of a particular regiment. Jeff may be the font of all knowledge, but I reckon such a specialist find is going to require some military detective work. Right over in the far corner there, several pieces of chain mail, both individual links and joined, and they're both copper alloy. You get that in the medieval period, by which I mean 15th century sometimes, but it's much more likely to be post-medieval. These are actually being made, of course, in the tower. The tower was the national almost factory for producing arms and armaments and armour. Okay. So very nice evidence for the manufacture that was going on in the tower itself over a period of time probably. Whilst Jeff gives us the lowdown on our finds, verifying everything and bringing decades of academic experience literally to the table, Steve's more your tin pot theory kind of guy. Of course, yeah. Jeff comes through with the, the, the good stuff, yeah. I yeah. come through with the quirky stuff. Yeah. This would have been made by the pattern cutter from the big sheet and then the pattern cutter cuts out. Now what was left over afterwards and also what wears out on the chain mail yeah. was also used for washing up. Really? Yeah, of course it was, yeah. So your Brillo pad that we have today, this was the Brillo pad of the day. To get all the grease and the animal stuff off it. Yeah, off yeah, it was really to greasy. Play. Yeah. So they used chain mail? Yeah, yeah. Do, you know, do we know this definitely? Better ask the boss. Jeff. True or false? I haven't heard of it myself. It's a good idea. I no, I've, I've read it. I've read it, Jeff. Take yeah. it from me. It's true. It has, you, the man has it's read it. It's true. It's true. And the I've book is it. good. Um, I've heard. I think of it being used to clean helmets and other pieces of armour where you've got a, a potential for rust, and you can put that into your helmet because it all goes together, of course, yeah. part of the armour, and you just basically shunt the helmet around, you and that it. cleans it. Okay. It's it certainly it. does it with that, and. Um, nobody's going to stop people doing it in other other okay, parts okay. of life. So, undoubtedly, our finds from the tower have a distinctly military feel. Time then for me and Steve to say adieu as we go our separate ways, armed with little more than enthusiasm and a thirst for answers. Time to delve a little deeper. Coming up, Steve attempts to solve the mysterious riddle of the Golden Horn, whilst I shoot down to Brighton to give him both barrels. In your face, Steve. After a good day's mudlarking at the Tower of London, mud god Steve Brooker and I came up with a treasure trove of artefacts with a distinctly military feel. So now we want some more expert illumination. For me, that means going ballistic. So those are the four musket balls we found at the foreshore of uh, the Tower of London by kind permission of Her Majesty, quite legitimately purloined. Um, now I could go to the Tower of London to find out all about these and indeed the weapons that fired them, but you know what? If you want to get your real hardcore anorak, you've got to come down here to Brighton to the lanes where the experts lurk. Here we go. I'm now with David Hawkins from the Lane's Armoury, and he really is one of the country's foremost military dealers. Well, that's why we came okay. all the way from the Tower okay. of London to okay. here, okay. so you must be pretty good. I found these on the foreshore a little bit early. If you'd like to just come down and have a look, there's the four I found. Uh, so let's do them one by one. So what type of musket did this one come from? That one is a little odd shaped, so yeah. it, it's difficult to say. It might have been a rejected made ball, because okay. that appears to be where it was cast okay. in the mould but it, that part has never been taken off. Okay. Now, you would normally have to have a perfect spherical ball for a musket ball yeah. or an arquebus. So this one looks like it might have been rejected. So that's a dud. Uh, so we've drawn a blank there. What about this little baby? Ah, now that is an interesting one. To me, that looks like archetypal brown bess musket ball. Tell me about the brown bess. Brown bess was an important gun, very important in history, military history, British and world history, really. Uh, it was introduced around 1715. It was used up until the 1830s. It saw some of the most interesting battles around the world, uh, certainly important during the American Revolutionary War, mm. and uh, one of the most famous battles of all time, effectively, Waterloo. So, so where were these actually made? They, the most famous ones, the most collectible ones, I find, are the ones made at the Tower of London, okay. the Tower Brown Besses. Have you got some there? Yes, a small selection of brown besses. That's a brown bess, is it? This is the archetypal British brown bess. A okay. particularly nice one. 
Made at the Tower of London. Particularly lovely example. A particularly nice. She says he made at the Tower. Oh, it actually says the Tower of London. It shows the cipher of George the Third. It's got the inspection marked there. Once it was finished being produced, they would then inspect it to make it, make sure it was all working properly. Yeah. There's no g gun then in, in British military history that can kind of match this in terms Nothing of... Nothing like In it. terms of battles fought. This really was the boy. It really was. Okay. Used by frontline troops. You could even try that musket ball of yours in the barrel to see can how we? it would load. Oh. It should do no harm whatsoever. Is, can I put it down the barrel? Yes, go ahead. To test if it is yes. from there. It's coming home. Are you ready? It's going to get that welcome home feeling as it drops down the barrel. Here we go. There it is. So it fits, it's fine, it is that's a brown it, bear. That's it, exactly the size. OK. So that's a brown bear's musket ball. Here, you can settle a bit of a dispute. I had a bit of a squabble with Steve mm. about the phrase, bite the bullet. Imagine, yeah, I've got to take your leg off, you've been yeah. injured. They'd make you bite the bullet. As I took your leg off, yeah, you'd actually bite down on one of these things. Now, is that true or not? In those days, every civilian gun had its own mould, its own exclusive calibre. Mm. So you'd bite the bullet if you were trimming it down effectively to your size. I would say the first one. Yes! <laughs> the bite, you'd actually bite the bullet, possibly in pain. Yes. In your face, Steve. Trimming it As down. As for trimming it down, I think you'd wear your teeth out faster. Yes. Even though lead okay. is soft, yeah. doing 